Mary Barra joined CNBC this morning where she was able to dodge, duck, dive, dip, and dodge the questions from the interviewers. Uh, jokes aside, I do think this was one of her less hyperbole, hyperbolic um, interviews, but nonetheless, uh, I still think that there is some some dodging of questions in the way she answers them that I think it'd be fun to address. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. But before we do that, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell, and let's get into it. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this interview with Mary Barra, and I'll talk along the way. Joining us here at Post 9, we've got General Motors Chair and CEO Mary Barra. For an exclusive interview, Mary, it's good to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Especially on a day like today. I mentioned the, the car numbers. So, so new cars still a pretty sharp rise year over year, though coming down month over month. What, what are you seeing at GM on pricing? Well, you know, we're still seeing a very consistent pricing. I think some of it is GM specific related. We have a really strong portfolio of products out with new products coming, both internal combustion and electric. So, uh, you know, right now we're seeing very consistent pricing, which I think is it bodes well for um, the interest in new car sales. What so I, I find this interesting. Uh, I think you see this a lot now with GM and with Ford um, and, and even Volkswagen now to an extent, but you're seeing more and more of these OEMs start to actually also continue to, I guess, build up their ICE business, which it seems like they actually have to do if they want to be profitable during this upcoming recession that we are going to have or in whatever. Uh, so interesting that she she uh, mentioned that. And uh, again, she you know, she says that, what they're seeing as far as a pricing structure is somewhat neutral. Uh, and I think really the reason she's saying that is because of pressures coming from Tesla, which we're about to discuss. And I'll give some more insight in that in a second. What about pricing on EVs, especially in light of the much hyped Tesla price cuts? Well, you know, I think uh, when you look at the EVs that we have right now, they're in demand, whether it's the Hummer um, EV truck, the Hummer SUV, the Lyric, and then we've got the Silverado EV coming, the, the Equinox, the Blazer. So we have a, a full lineup of EVs coming out this year that we think were well-priced um, with, with how we've set them up. And uh, with the strong demand, I think that's reinforcing it. Okay, so let's let's take a second. Let's take a step back. All right, so she's sitting there saying that, you know, they have strong demand, strong pricing power and all that, yet... What we do know is that they really have two EVs that are out. You've got the Hummer and the Bolt, right? And then the other ones, I guess the Lyric might be out. No, I'm not even sure at this point, but really it's the Bolt and the Hummer, all right? And as far as the rest of them, they're not out or they're going to come out this year. So pricing structure, like you don't really know because they're not out yet. Now, maybe you have some reservations, but in this kind of economy and when we're seeing what Tesla's doing, dropping prices, I find it very hard to believe that we can take any any type of reservations, you know, for anything other than face value, right? So put those aside. Let's look at what you have actually done as far as your pricing structure. Well, with the Chevy Bolt, you have dropped your prices a lot, right? And even despite you dropping those prices and despite uh, credits and everything, you're discontinuing the Bolt. Now, I get it. You know, you're trying to maybe come with a, a different platform with the old TM, right? A lot of that can can make a lot of sense if it's true, but it definitely seems that at a sub thirty thousand dollar price target, you would think demand would be unlimited at that point. But okay, put that to the side. I get it. Maybe you're gonna go with Ultium, a new platform. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You want to focus on some of these other initiatives and again the Ultium platform. Okay, so what's your rationale behind the Hummer? Well, the Hummer in the last quarter sold two, not 200, not 2,000, two units, a total of two. That's it. So that means either there's a demand issue where people don't want to buy it, or there's a pricing issue, one or the other. Now, I read a couple articles, and it seems like this is explained away by people saying, oh, well, they stopped focusing right now on the Hummer because they don't, now they want to focus on the Silverado because that's a more important market, and they need to make sure they do it right to compete with the F-150. Okay, as much as I want to call her out on this or them out on this, you know, when I read this article, that does make sense, okay? It does make sense to prioritize the Silverado. And if you're using the same kind of lineup or same, I don't know, that's the thing, are you using the same lines for the Hummer and the Silverado? That doesn't seem efficient. And if this is really going to be your, your move into trucks and you're going to keep the Hummer, then why wouldn't you create two different lines? It's, it just seems a little confused. Like 
on the surface level, okay, I guess it makes sense, but I wish they would give more details as to why they have to stop and sacrifice the Hummer. Why can't why can't they walk and chew gum at the same time? Right? It, it seems like it's something that you should be able to do. Anyways, my point really here is that clearly something's going on. Okay, we can't always have excuses for every little thing. Right? I, again, like when the Cybertruck comes out. Like we're not stopping production of the model Y because of that. I mean, they both use 4680 batteries. So they probably are going to use the same inverters, probably have very similar motors, right? I mean, no one has more uh, consistent and similar pieces in their vehicles than what Tesla has, right? And they do that for economies of scale. So I don't know. I, I you know, I'll, I'll give this a pass. Maybe you're right. Maybe we'll see. Apparently, you have all these new EV models that are going to come out this year. Let's see. This is the year where they're really going to have to put up or shut up, right? This is going to be very telling. So let's continue. So he's not creating a price war in EVs. Uh, you know, I think you know, we have I always have to watch. But with the EVs we have coming out right now, we feel confident in the pricing that we've set. Uh, that will be in the sweet spot, again, with a product that has a tremendous amount of features, the right range. If it's a truck, it's got the right payload, uh, uh, towing, et cetera. So we're confident that the product is going to be well-received. So, I mean, demand clearly is strong. You grew double digits revenues last quarter, raised your guidance. The question is, are we seeing peak demand now at a time where we're seeing signs that the, the consumer is slowing down? Bank of America credit card data, for instance, saw its first month over month decline, or month, monthly decline in a while. So can that demand really hold up? Are you seeing signs of a slowdown? Well, we aren't now. Uh, you know, we are watching very carefully and will adjust. We plan this year to be very conservative, not knowing. I mean, we're in unprecedented times when you look at the auto industry because of COVID following the semiconductor. You know, we're just now starting to get supply where it needs to be. And frankly, we have more work to do to get the right number of vehicles on our dealer lots. So, you know, but we watch it carefully. And that's also why we took action earlier in the year and are well on our way to take $2 billion out of our cost structure. All right. I want to pause there. So two things were talked about there for a second. Uh, so first, they, uh, sh it was asked about, is Elon creating a price war? Um, I don't know if that's Elon's intention, but I do think it's creating a price war. And here's why I don't think Elon is creating a price war, but it is a repercussion of what they're doing. What Tesla's doing, this isn't just Elon, right? It's not like Elon has every makes every decision in the company. Like, he, like that that doesn't scale, and they need to be able to scale. What what Tesla's doing is they are matching price to production. So the more vehicles they produce, and because they have the best data, best real time data possible, which is how I wish CPI was. You know, speaking of CPI, that came out today, but they have a real time data. So they know where the price has to be to move their, their production, uh, their, their volume of, of vehicles that they produce. So they're very, they're very good at moving prices when, when they need to, to sell the vehicles they've made. And they don't want to stop making vehicles. They're not going to sacrifice production. They're going to keep scaling, scaling, which is very much the, the DNA of Tesla, right? They're going to ignore what's going on in the world and the economy. They've got their mission. They're going to execute their mission, even if that means they have to sell vehicles at zero margin, right? Elon said this, right? And, and I think you should maybe take him at his word for that, that if it comes to that, he will do that. They will do that. But the point is they will move prices in order to move their inventory, right? And they're going to keep building. They have a goal. They're going to hit it. Now, as a result of that, that puts on a lot of pressure on OEMs especially the, the legacy OEMs who are trying to get into electric vehicles. So I don't know how much I believe Mary Barr right now when she doesn't feel the pressure of it. Now, mind you, you got a Bolt and you got the Hummer. You're not even making the Hummer right now and the Bolt you're planning on discontinuing and everything else isn't out in the market yet. So you probably do feel comfortable with the prices at the moment because you just have reservations and you don't actually have any real market analysis. And on top of that, any market analysis you would have is going to be very delayed. Why is it going to be delayed? Because the problem with companies like Ford and GM is that they actually have dealerships. Now, some people like Gordon Johnson will spin that as a positive, but I think it's a negative because when you have these dealerships, then you have delays in understanding of what pricing structure you need to be at to move your inventory. And so I think Ford and GM will see big delays in their data and their information as time goes on. And it'd be very, it'll be very interesting to see how inventory starts to pile up for them. 
Ford, I think right now has a really big problem with inventory. GM, maybe, maybe not. But what we do know is that they are stopping the Hummer production for the Silverado. And to me, that sounds like they're stopping production of, of the Hummer because there's not enough demand and they don't want to build up supply. So it's interesting. Okay. So the second point is, are we seeing peak demand? And Mary Barra seems to not think so right now, although you can kind of see her saying this in a way that's right now we don't see it, but we're keeping a close eye on this. And I do think we are potentially seeing peak demand right now for ice. Okay. I think we're going to continue to see rising EV, right? I, I don't think, despite recessions or anything, I don't think we'll have an issue selling EVs. Now, they may need to come down price. Tesla might need to take a hit of margin. I think GM and Ford, I think they'll also be able to sell everything they can as long as they lower price. Again, they, they, it's a hit for them because they're taking on the chin, right? Like Ford, for example, they make their vehicles. They are taking about 60K loss per vehicle sold. So I think, GM and Ford will be able to sell everything if they can drop prices, but they're going to pay the penalty for that. But with that said, I think EVs will continue to, to go up and to the right, but at the, at the detriment for the ICE vehicles. And so when, with GM still in this very early, early stages of ramping up what they're trying to do with the EV market, it's going to be at their detriment. And so I do think it's, it's a concern. I do think you're seeing a slowing economy. You heard uh, the question just there, uh, there that was uh, that mentioned the entire um, uh, Bank of America sees credit card spending down month over month for the first time in however long. Uh, like it, you have to see it. Like it's, I've been talking about this for a while. Like the economy is for sure slowing. And if you don't believe me, just look at inflation. We've gone from nine point one all the way down to four point nine this morning. That is the definition of slowing. We're planning conservatively, but seizing the opportunity with strong demand for our products. What about rates? You always see an impact of higher rates on the auto market. We've seen loan delinquencies rise. Are you seeing that? Uh, you know, when we look at our at our customer, especially the business that's done through uh, GM Financial, we have a very strong prime business. And so although we're seeing, you know, some uh, lowering, we're really still well above uh, pre-pandemic rates. So again, a, a strong consumer, strong concerned. pricing. Yeah, but again, we're watching it carefully because we know that this is something that can change quite uh, quickly. You mentioned that. I was happy to hear this. It's, uh, I was actually looking at some data earlier today. Uh, it does look like um, the delinquency on auto loans aren't as high as what I thought they were going to be at this point. So I think that's a good sign. In fact, just in general, delinquencies for, for all kinds of loans aren't really that high at all. Um, what is high, though, is debt. Hearing Mary Barr say that, you know, again, I think that's promising. But again, even then, you, you could hear it, the tone in her voice where they're keeping an eye on it. It almost seems like they're a little paranoid about it. So I guess in the big scheme of things, it's a good sign. And, you know, I think that's a good measuring stick for, for moving forward into the economy, but something that we should keep an eye on. And the cost cuts, Wall Street was enthusiastic about that last quarter of the speed that, that that was happening. I saw there was a report of more layoffs at an engineering center around Detroit. Where are you in that process? So we did do a, a voluntary separation program. Uh, and then some of the, the layoffs that you referred to, those are with our contract employees that we always had, you know, will bubble up and bubble down, um, you know, from a contract or a temporary workforce perspective. But I'm very pleased with what we've been able to do. It's roughly half of the $2 billion and, and really, it's, it's much more than just reducing costs from a people perspective. We've used it to streamline the organization, reduce bureaucracy. And, you know, we did it in a way without causing a lot of internal strife, you know, uh, because it was a voluntary program. And I'm very pleased with where we're headed and the cultural change it's driving. So when Mary was talking there about the layoffs and the voluntary separation, all right, a couple of thoughts on that. First thought, the voluntary separation. I love when companies do that, right? I, I think that every company should always lead with that, with the voluntary separation. So kudos on GM for doing that. Uh, Twitter did that as well. Elon and them did that. Uh, but then from there, you know, if you still need to have more layoffs to hit like a number that you're trying to get to, you know, it is what it is. The business is what it is. And at the end of the day, you know, we can't keep everybody if we're seeing certain, um, certain, you know, metrics that need to be hit from a financial perspective in order for to keep the business thriving. So, all right, I get that point. But what's interesting was when she talked about the layoffs that that came from the contract workers. Does that mean 
the UAW, United Auto Workers Union, because they're technically not GM employees. They're UAW employees. And so are those the ones that took the hits and they're the ones that got all the layoffs? That's interesting, right? Because the way she spoke about it was somewhat dismissive. Now, I don't know for a fact if that is UAW uh, employees or if that's some other organization for contract workers, but I thought that was very telling. Anyways, so long of the short, it seems like we we got kind of more of the same from Mary Barr, where she kind of, like I said, dodged, duck, dive, dipped, and dodged again some of the questions. She didn't really address you know, what Tesla's doing from a pricing perspective. She didn't really acknowledge the fact that the Hummer has only sold two units in this last quarter. They didn't talk about the bull. I mean, she, she talked about the bull in a good way, but she didn't mention that they're deprecating it. And then all these other vehicles are coming out this year, supposedly, but they don't actually have the data for them. They don't actually know if these prices are going to withstand what the market will dictate. The market will be very brutal to you if you are, don't come in at the right price and they will have to drop prices quickly. And here's the problem with that. If they have to drop prices, they're going to run into the same problem inevitably that Ford's running into where they can't scale yet, right? It's going to take time to scale in a good cost structure. So we'll see what happens. You know, apparently they're going to do everything this year and they're going to catch Tesla soon. So we'll see what happens. But I thought that was kind of an interesting one, especially today on CPI day to hear what she was saying, to see, I think it's good to use these companies as a measuring stick on what's going on and get kind of the pulse of the economy. It definitely seems like GM is doing better than Ford when it comes to volumes of vehicles and uh, inventory. But I would be, I'd be very shocked if GM doesn't go the way of Ford. You know, it, it, this is sad to say, but I do think that GM will outlast Ford. I do think GM has a better strategy than Ford. I know that's not the most popular opinion in the EV community, but the reason I think that is because GM is focused on, on trying to vertically integrate as much as possible with the Ultium platform. I don't think the Ultium platform is good. I think pouch uh, design batteries are a mistake. It's very bad for, uh, for, uh, for getting rid of heat. And that's where fire start. And, you know, they'll eventually learn their lessons. I also don't think their powertrains are very efficient. And on top of that, they're not really that vertically integrated because uh, I believe the Ultium battery uh, design is really kind of co-engineered with uh, Panasonic or Samsung. I, I forget which one. But the point is, it's not the same as the 4680 with what Tesla's doing. But we'll see what happens. All right. You know, I, at the end of the day, Tesla can't do everything on their own. And I, if it were, it, you know, if it's up to me, I'd rather see more United States uh, based EV um, EV companies survive than not. But I don't know. It, it's going to be very tough for them, especially when we start to hit this weird cost structure where people are buying less ice, people are buying more EVs. And then what are you going to do? And, and this is where Ford, I think, has the right mindset of becoming more of a niche company rather than what GM's trying to do with all these models. Ford is being very strategic about what segments they go into, what models they introduce, whereas GM is trying to continue with their same approach. Now, so, so it's interesting, right? Because I'm saying two different things. I'm saying Ford has, or GM has a better approach than Ford, but now I'm saying Ford is better approach than, than GM. So what's the difference? GM has a better approach with regards to the Ultium battery and thinking ahead about all this and localizing the manufacturing. But Ford has a better approach, in my opinion, as far as choosing what segments they're going to go into and the way they approach it, understanding that they're going to be a, a niche competitor. So we'll see what happens, right? The, the, the next year, the next two years will be fascinating to see how, how all of this really unfolds. And I really think we'll know which way things are going, who's going to die, who's going to survive, who's going to be a shell of themselves and who, who may, uh, who, who may buy other companies, right? What, what kind of uh, mergers might we see or acquisitions? It'll all happen in the next two years, and it's going to be fascinating. All right, I've spoken enough. You guys don't need to look at me anymore. Have a good day. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Don't forget, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Ring that bell. Love you all. Peace.